Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out this morning. Um, this morning, we're doing, we're jumping ahead of only a century to Blaise Pascal. We were doing John Calvin last week, and we're jumping to Blaise Pascal. Calvin was a Frenchman, as I mentioned last time, and uh, was in exile from France from almost his entire life. But ha his passion was to reform the French church, right? And so he actually succeeds to a certain degree. You may have heard of the wars of religion that broke out in the middle of the 16th century in France. That was a lot of his followers doing. Um, and so a group of French, uh, several French nobles convert to Calvin's view of Christianity and develop what is called the Huguenot Church. You've probably heard of that. Um, it turns out my mother, I had no idea. I thought I chose these disciplines by free choice. It's all DNA. My mother's middle name, she was Ann Gaylord Morley Zachman. And Gaylord turns out to be an anglicized version of Gayard. And Gayard was a family of Huguenots who moved from France to London to, to flee persecution after St. Bartholomew's Day's massacre. So, so the Huguenots are very known to Pascal in uh, France during his time, but he's really not interested in them. Like he knows about them, but he's not a sympathizer. He's not hostile, he never wrote anything against them, but, uh, but he's not uh, fond of them, if you will, or not supporting them. But he is very fond of uh, a movement called the Jansenists. There's actually a very famous movie back in the French art movie days called My Night at Maud's uh, about this guy who's a Jansenist, Christian, very stern, uh, spending the whole evening with this woman, well, actually an entire night, with this woman talking. And they're talking about Jansenism, and the whole time there's this tremendous sexual tension in the room, but they don't do anything. It's like he, he succeeds, so he keeps trying to convince her of his Jansenist position. But the Jansenists were French Roman Catholics who were followers of Cornelius Jansen, and Jansen wrote this book called The Augustinus, and it's this huge uh, book, uh, and it's all of Augustine's anti-Pelagian writings on grace. Um, and so, uh, and what Jansen was convinced of was that the Roman Catholic Church of the 17th century had abandoned the Doctor of Grace, had abandoned Augustine, and had gone in this direction toward the Pelagians. Uh, there is some evidence that he was not wrong. Uh, and Pascal, through his father's influence and through the influence of Jansenists on his family, became a member of this group, the Jansenist group. Um, they were especially horrified by the exhortation, you'll love this, to participate in communion frequently. So the, the Jesuits were pushing this idea, you shouldn't stay away from communion. <laughs> Uh, it's good for your soul as long as you're not in a state of mortal sin. There's nothing wrong with going to communion every week. And Pascal was horrified by this, right? So he's one of he's much more traditional. Your life should be much more penitential than that. And he thought that the Jesuits were very breezy in terms of their spirituality. So so he's known as one of these, pardon my French, badass guys, <laughs> you know, a, a buzz killer basically, a Jansenist. But, his, but the point was, he thought that the grace of God was, was immensely important, and without it, we, you know, we don't have anything. And so that was, he thought, uh, Pascal thought that Augustine and the Jansenists were right, and so he devoted a large part of his life to supporting their cause, especially at the University of Paris. That's where they were um, trying to teach, and also then were being persecuted by the Jesuits. He wrote another book to expose the Jesuits as being frauds, uh, in their opposition to the Jansenists uh, called the Provincial Letters. You may have heard of that. It's been, I was talking to Patsy before we began, it's been ranked as one of the greatest polemical works ever written. Uh, it's such a work of art in French that French was taught using it as the kind of textbook. And so whole generations of French youth were, in, were instilled with an anti-Jesuit attitude, which of course the Jesuits are still trying to overcome. So he has, he has a, n a number of different influences that he, uh, he makes. He's really quite a remarkable guy, especially for how young he was when he died. He's like a Mozart or a Kierkegaard. They're very similar. Brilliant, brilliant people who kind of burn out like a meteor, but leave an incredible uh, trace behind them, right? The, if, you, if you ask people, like in a university, who is Blaise Pascal? I found this out at Notre Dame. He's a mathematician, right? If, it, it would be like saying, who's Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart? You'd say he's a musician, right, a composer. 
So, so Pascal was primarily known in his day, not as a Jansenist, although that was part of his role, but as a mathematician. And he was a mathematical prodigy. And, his and it's very similar to Mozart, actually. His father knew he was a prodigy. And so his mother dies when he's fairly young. And he has two sisters, one older and one younger. And his youngest sister, Jacqueline, was his closest friend, uh, which is really interesting as well. So, uh, but his father took him under his wing and would go around the city of Paris with him, showing him off. And uh, he was a real whiz-bang at Euclidean geometry in particular, which was in the 17th century, mathematicians were using geometry. And they thought, actually, it was the key that unlocked every door. So if you read Descartes, Descartes very geometric in his argument. You start with the theorem, and you work down from there to a conclusion that's absolutely certain. Spinoza writes his classic work, The Ethics, based entirely on geometric proofs. So it's really interesting. So it was, it was very much the science, if you will, of the day, the mathematics of geometry. And, and Pascal just got it. He, intuited, he intuited, intuited Euclidean geometry without being taught it. That's when his father's like, OK, we got we to gotta take this kid on the road, right? So the other thing is um, Pascal's father, the Jansenist, he was not a Jansenist yet, but his father hated the Jesuits. Right? And so he wouldn't send his son to a Jesuit school. Unfortunately, by the middle of the 17th or early 17th century, the Jesuits ran every school in France, right? which is a total surprise because Ignatius of Loyola never intended to go into education. He just in 1548 was asked, can you help us out starting this school? And all of a sudden, the Jesuits, one of their main things is education. But it was not by design. So anyway. They, they wound up taking over or starting all the schools in France. So his father homeschooled him. He said, I'm not going to let those Jesuits get near you. So, so, so Pascal's, uh, as I said, his great gift is mathematics. And he actually advances geometry beyond itself. Late in life, uh, he was very aware of his ability and was very proud. Right. So pride, we're going to see pride as one of his major categories. And uh, later in life, he poses a contest of the cycloid. And the cycloid is the line that's generated by if you put a piece of chalk on a tire or a wheel and then roll the wheel, what is the line? Can you do the mathematics of the line that that chalk would create? So it would be kind of a spiral going along. And that geomet uh, geometers can't do points in motion. It's all points relative to each other in space. And, and Pascal, of course, won his own contest. <laughs> I always wonder how he awarded himself. Like, and the winner is Blaise Pascal. <laughs> you know, here I am. So, so that was fairly late in life. So he still had a lot of pride in his mathematical ability. But he made a number of contributions in other areas, too. I just go through them really quickly, because he's so fascinating to me. I already mentioned his French literary skills were exceptional. right? And the provincial letters were like this gold standard of French at the time, and still are considered that. He also, uh, and he develops, nearly develops calculus, but he's on his way to calculus. He also, to help his friends win at gambling, he develops probability mathematics. And I remember studying mathematics in high school. One of the things we had to learn was probability. I'm like, I was, I love geometry, right? I love it because I'm very orderly and everything is. And so probability, it sounds like a total mess, right? But that was Pascal, right? So he could tell his friends when to bet and what the odds are of winning and things like that. We are now saturated with this kind of mathematics, right? Just saturated. Algorithms. Yeah, algorithm, that's algorithms, right? And so probability, and, and AI, that's going to boost probability mathematics into another sphere altogether. That's all coming from Pascal. It's amazing to me. Um, so he, he develops that. He, he realizes that water will adhere to itself, so he develops hydraulics. And he used all of this to help people. So um, he helps drain a swamp that was leading to a lot of mosquito disease, mosquito-borne disease. So he, he's the first person. So every time the flaps go down or up on a plane, thank Blaise Pascal. He figured that out. He develops the first mass transit system in Paris. And if you go to Paris now, there'll, there'll be references to him in the metro. Uh, they'll, they'll call it the Pascal, if you will. Um, what's another? Oh, and his father uh, had to do a lot of calculations uh, for his work. And Pascal develops to help him the one of the first mechanical computers. <clears throat> Can you, and it almost killed him, actually, the amount of work it took to, to build that machine. But that was simply to help his father out. 
So, so he's really an amazing, uh, amazing person. He also, he took exception to, to Descartes, who's a contemporary of his. Uh, Descartes says uh, he thought Aristotle was right, that nature abhors a vacuum. And Pascal thought this was very arrogant for reason to decide what the senses should tell us. That tells you something about him, right? He thought reason could be very arrogant. Uh, and so he participates, he repeats an experiment that this fellow Torricelli did in Italy, where he took a, a, a basin of mercury, God help us, and put a test tube in it, and then inverted it into the mercury, and so then the mercury settles down, what's in the test tube, right? Nothing. And then they took the, the vat, can you imagine? Thank God he only did this experiment once, right? breathing all those fumes. But anyway, they took the, the vat of mercury up a hill and the mercury rose. So they're, they're discovering barometric pressure, right? And then they went back down and the mercury went down. And so he wrote an essay on, essay on this defending the reality of a vacuum. It wasn't an absolute vacuum, but he wasn't wrong. And when Descartes met him, <laughs> they met, Descartes met him after he published this article, and he, he told a friend, he, a friend of his, said, what did you think of Blaise Pascal? And he said, me thinks he has too much vacuum between his ears. <laughs> so there, was, there was no love lost between these guys, okay? Um, but, the, but what we'll be looking at today is, is uh, his, what he calls the apology for the Christian religion. So this is another thing that he was trying to do. So, I mean, he really is, it's amazing. You could just talk about his accomplishments without this. Um, but he's really an amazing figure in that 100 years after Calvin, Pascal figures out where modernity is headed, right? There's another figure a few uh, centuries later, Zorn Kierkegaard figures this out also. But Pascal is remarkable to me because he's in the 1600s. He can see where things are going. And where things are going, interestingly, has nothing really to do with these religious controversies about which, which I was speaking. Where things are going is where we are now, where people are either nuns or they're duns, right? So the, and, and the nuns, by and large, in our day, were raised, and everyone says, well, if we just raised our children in church and got them catechized, then this problem wouldn't be happening. Well, guess what? including my son, most of the nuns you will ever meet were raised in church and left, right? And so Pascal's beginning to see this in his own day, in the 1600s, that there are people who have really just had it with the Catholic Church in particular. Uh, and they think that the Catholic Church is traditionalist and obscurantist and stupid, you know, and also obstructionist, that, and one of the things that they they were especially chafed at was the condemnation of Galileo. So the Galileo controversy, which happens in the early 1600s, was very much on people's minds. And so there's a lot of interest in experimentation, there's a lot of interest in developing empirical science, and the church seems to be against it, right? And so a lot of people thought, let's throw off the yoke, right? Let's throw off the yoke and use our senses and our reason to figure out what's going on. We don't need revelation, we don't need clergy, we don't need theologians, we don't need doctrine, we just need to use the brains God gave us to lead a happy life, right? And so they're done with Christianity. They know Christianity and they're done with it. This is a really different audience than an audience that doesn't know anything about Christianity, right? So if you tell these people, well, you have to understand, we were created by a good God, and then we fell in Adam, and then by then they're out the door, right? <laughs> they're just gone. You start with the whole catechetical thing, and then we fell in Adam, and we, oh, you know, just the opening prayer of the Eucharist that we use most of the time. When we had fallen into sin and death, and we, you sent your only son, they're like, yeah, whatever, I'm out of here, right? So if you just trot out the Christian narrative, they're, I mean, they're so done with that, you wouldn't even get started with them. So how do you talk to people? We're in this situation now. How do you talk to people who are nun and done, right? And duns are usually the people who've been abused by the church. And they would say a lot of these free thinkers, they called themselves libertins, they called themselves free thinkers, they would say they were abused by the church. The church's authority condemned Galileo, even though they thought Galileo was right. So how do you address them in a way that draws them back to the Christian religion in a way that they would find compelling. 
Now, whether or not he succeeds in doing this is another question, but that he thought about doing it is amazing because we're, we're talking about a teeny tiny percentage of people who are thinking this way in his day. And yet that's where things are going. It's called secularization, right? And it just takes off. So he's, he sees the, the, the growing wedge, if you will, of the secularizing move, which is freeing itself not just from Christianity, but from all things religious. It's, uh, and they're, they're just done with it. So this is, this is the task um, that he sets himself, and it's pretty impressive, actually, that he, that he attempts to do this. In a lot of ways, because he's a mathematician and he's an experimenter and things like that, he, he has a lot in common with free thinkers. In fact, sometimes I think he was a free thinker for a while and then came back to Christianity. It's hard to say because he didn't ever say that, but he has a lot of sympathy with and understanding of what their issues are. And he's especially intrigued, and this is, I find, I love astronomy, and so I love this part of Pascal. Um, the telescope and the microscope, they're grinding lenses during this day, right? And so Galileo develops the first telescope that you can actually use. Telescopes used to be built by digging huge holes in the ground. I don't know if you knew that. We think of going up on a mountain now and putting a telescope up there. But the early telescopes, for instance, in the Muslim world and, and elsewhere, were they would dig a hole deep into the ground. So that would block out daylight, right? You could actually observe things in the middle of the day that way. Um, but in any case, uh, Galileo develops a telescope with ground lenses that you can actually use more easily. And so they're realizing the universe is immense. It's so much more immense than we ever imagined. Um, and, and also imperfect, right? So, so there isn't this sense that once you get above the moon, there's this eternity before you. Um, the, the sublunar realm was the garbage can of the universe, they thought. Uh, that's where all the bad stuff settles down. So the Earth is the center of the universe isn't good news. <laughs> it, means, it means that's where all the crud from the universe settled in. Uh, so you want to get up. You want to get up above the lunar level up to the stars, right? Well, what Galileo discovers, and this was earth-shattering in its own way, is the stars are as imperfect as the Earth is. And the sun is imperfect. He discovered the sun is not a sphere. It's not a perfect sphere, and it has spots. There's spots on the sun, which is like it's defiled, right? So they, so, um, so, but Pascal's very interested in the telescope, and so he's and he's assuming these free-thinking uh, friends of his are also interested in, and know about what the telescope has shown them. They're also using the microscope, right? So you get these these lenses show you just how immensely vast the universe is. We're still fascinated by this, right? We built this huge James Webb telescope to go way out in space and park itself with this big canopy behind it to block the sun to look at stuff we've never seen before. So this is just this is the, just kind of the same trajectory that Pascal was on. And the and the scale of the universe just gets getting more and more infinite. Pascal just knew it was infinite, right? Let's just stipulate it's infinite. Um, the, but it goes the other way. The microscope shows us that the world is infinitely teeny. I mean, I've never ceased to marvel when you see a little teeny insect, you know, teeny, teeny, teeny insect, something you can see with your eye, with legs and a brain and, you know, moving around. It's like, how does it do that? It's a little thing. So he knows also that things just get, you can, it, they're infinitely divisible. And so it goes all the way down toward nothing. And so, so he realizes his own generation should know that what he call, he says we're suspended in a medium of vast extent between infinity and nothing. And so we're giants compared to these teeny insects, or let alone amoebae, or things like that. And then we're teeny tiny compared to the cosmos. We're not even an afterthought compared to the cosmos. And so what are we? We're teeny tiny and insignificant nothing compared to the universe and colossal giants compared to what's beneath us, and there's nothing holding us steady. We're just floating between infinity and nothing, and we don't know our place, and we don't know uh, what's going to hold us. He has this very haunting description of this. He says, we sail within a vast sphere. This isn't in your sheet. <laughs> I'm cheating. I just brought this in. We sail within a vast sphere, ever drifting in uncertainty, driven from end to end, when we think to attach ourselves to any point and to fasten to it, it wavers and leaves us. And if we follow it, it eludes our grasp, slips past us, and vanishes forever. Nothing stays for us. 
This is our natural condition, and yet most contrary to our inclination. We burn with desire to find solid ground and an ultimate foundation whereon to build a tower reaching to the infinite, but our whole groundwork cracks and the earth opens to abysses. That's Pascal, right? That's, I mean, really. <laughs> Can you imagine? So, so that's, you know, the goal of his day is to use reason to build that foundation to then build a tower to infinity, and he realizes there is no such place to build it. Everything moves, everything shifts, everything cracks, everything falls. And so, um, so given that, uh, what then, how could you develop an apology for the Christian religion in a situation like that? It's really interesting. Um, it's, what's fascinating to me is that he used the telescope and the microscope theologically, and very few people do that to this day. I mean, it's really remarkable. So kudos to him. <laughs> okay. so, so, so what we're looking at today is the, is the argument. There are several, several arguments. If you've ever read the Pensee, the Pensee are the fragments that he never pulled together into the apology for the Christian religion. Right? So he has several trajectories he tries out. You know, here's what I'm going to do first. Here's what I'm going to do second. And then I'll, you'll find somewhere else in there, here's what I'm going to do first, it's really different, and here's second, and all this. So, so this is Zachman's attempt to put together a coherent narrative out of the Pensee, but there are other alternatives too. And I was telling Patsy there are great lines in the Pensee. There's actually a book entitled Cleopatra's Nose. <laughs> it's, it's this one line thing he has in his Pensee, Cleopatra's Nose. And he's, he talks about the absurdity of human history, that these little teeny accidents of history can change everything. He says, what if Cleopatra had, a, had an ugly hook nose, right? I mean, Mark Anthony would never have wanted to be with her, and history would be changed forever. So, so there are all these little clues that he had, like Cleopatra's nose, that you don't really know what to do with because he didn't fit it all together. But there are things, I think, that actually do work to fit things together, so that's what we'll be looking at. And it's my attempt to build a foundation <laughs> that's just going to crack and fall into the abyss. But we see his audience uh, in the very first quote. Um, he says, he, so his audience are the people he's trying to reach are these free thinkers. He says, they are people who have heard it said that it is the fashion to be thus daring. So it's very fashionable, fashionable to free yourselves from Christian faith. It is what they call shaking off the yoke. And they try to imitate this. But it would not be difficult to make them understand how greatly they deceive themselves in thus seeking esteem. This is not the way to gain it. So he's trying to warn them, if you think it's really cool to throw off the yoke, think again. Right? Not, don't keep the yoke on yourself, but don't give up on the Christian religion. Because the Christian religion is not what you think it is. That's going to be his point. And I think his point actually is, he makes the Christian religion surprising to me. <laughs> so he sees things going on in it that are really something. Um, so so he's, he's addressing people who, uh, who think they've understood everything and thrown it off. But he wants to remind them that there are questions that thinking people should address that these people are not addressing. Right? And he finds it appalling that they think they're following reason by ignoring the very questions that are at the heart of human existence. Right? And you can see then later on, the folks called the existentialists, they're going to love Pascal because Pascal thinks the primary task of human reason is to think about human existence, especially human existence in light of death. Right? And so he's, again, he's anticipating people like Martin Heidegger by centuries. It's really amazing. So he's, he's uh, talking about the, the free thinkers who don't think about these issues anymore. And he says, how can, these, uh, how can people hold these opinions? How can it happen that the, follower, the following argument occurs to a reasonable man, to a reasonable person? And here's the argument he, he credits to these free thinkers. This is the, the quotations are what he thinks they're thinking. I know not who put me into the world, nor what the world is, nor what I myself am. I am in terrible ignorance about everything. I see those frightful spaces of the universe which surround me, and I find myself tied to one corner of this vast expanse without knowing why I am put in this place rather than in another, nor why the short time which is given me to live is assigned to me at this point rather than at another of the whole eternity which was before me or which shall come after me. I see nothing but infinities on all sides, 
which surround me as an atom and as a shadow which endures only for an instant and returns no more. All I know is that I must soon die, but what I know least is this very death which I cannot escape. As I know not whence I come, so I know not whither I go. I only know that in leaving this world, I fall forever either into annihilation or into the hands of an angry God without knowing to which of these two states I shall be forever assigned. Such is my state, full of weakness and uncertainty. And from all this I conclude that I ought to spend all the days of my life without caring to inquire into what must happen to me. Wow, that is so good. And it's, a good it's a good one. So, so I conclude from, and he's just telling them what they know. So this is what free thinkers should know. We don't know how we got here. We don't know why we're here now instead of then. We don't know where we're going. And guess what? Let's just not think about it. That's reasonable. That's reasonable. You would call a person reasonable who thought that way. He says it's like awakening in a prison cell and finding out you're going to be executed, but not inquiring as to why and not inquiring as to finding out whether you could stay the execution. Instead, just playing solitary in your cell. That's reasonable. <laughs> so, so this is what he's calling them out on. That, and you can see especially uh, their neglect of what's going to happen to them when they die. Uh, when I first read Pascal, I was convinced when I was young that, I, that it was a, the annihilation, that it's just nothing. And so when I first read him, I'm like, wow, he really gets that, <laughs> right? So anyway, yeah, Gabe? Um, would you say that in a sense that he without realizing that it's still sort of basic for most people who are not the kind of people who are Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah, yeah. He's he's seeing he's seeing a number of things actually. He's seeing the limitations of rationalism, and he's also then opening a door that the romantics will also walk through. Um, but yeah, so um, <clears throat> but it's not there's not a direct line, but it, he is he. You can see a number of avenues coming out of him. It's how, it's also hard to know how widely read he was at different points in time, but uh, yeah, he's he has a lot. You could see a lot of things coming out of that, especially, as I said, existentialism how in particular. You, so, how do you categorize or describe romanticism? How do you give me a test of what that is? Romanticism would be, I mean, it's a very broadly used category, but it comes out of the uh, post-Kantian world, where Kant had d divided the world up, if you will, between uh, <clears throat> the noumenal realm of, reason, of practical reason and the phenomenal world of our senses. And they were seeking a unity of the two. They thought that the Enlightenment, and uh, in particular, ended in this kind of bifurcation of reality. And so they're looking for a principle of unification, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, Schleiermacher would be a great instance of this. He says that Christianity is not knowing or doing, but feeling. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't mean feeling as in emotions. He means feeling in this transcendental sense of uh, the transcendence of subject and object. So, so there's a part of human consciousness for Schleiermacher that transcends the subject and object that Kant leaves before us. And that's the basis of religion. So that would be the goal of the Romantics was unification of a bifurcated world. Not a bad goal. No, not at all. No, we're still Romantics, actually. We're still looking for that. Um, they also paradoxically saw it in national identity, and that was, that was something that was going to come back and bite, <laughs> bite us uh, down the line. But... Um, yeah, so that would be, uh, romantics would be people seeking to unify what the philosophers had left um, asunder and also then to turn to aesthetics. A lot of it is turning to an aesthetic view of the world over against uh, practical reason or pure reason. Um, Kant wrote a critique of judgment, which they often cite as kind of the way forward. So anyway, that would be, that's jumping ahead a couple centuries or at least a century and a half. So anyway. So what, what, what explains then our ability to realize that we don't know where we came from, we're surrounded by these infinities, we don't know where we're going, we're either going to be annihilated or in the hands of an angry God and we don't think about it. Well, for him, um, the, the answer is diversion. Right? We just divert our attention away from thinking about ourselves. And if you ever thought uh, he was not prescient uh, in other ways, he just figures our culture out in a heartbeat. If he'd known about smartphones and apps and Facebook, he'd be like, I told you this was coming anyway. So he says in that next paragraph, man is obviously made to think. 
It is his whole dignity and his whole merit, and his whole duty is to think as he ought. And of course, how ought he to think? Now, the order of thought is to begin with self. So, right? so what we should think about is ourselves, and with the self's author and its end. So we think about ourself, who put us here, where we're going, right? But that's not what his contemporaries are doing. They're not thinking about themselves, they're not thinking about God, and they're not thinking about the goal. Um, <clears throat> now, what does the world think? Never of this, but of dancing, playing the lute, singing, making verses, or making up words that begin with P, <laughs> right? <laughs> Running at the ring, fighting, making oneself king, talking about Trump's latest outrage, without thinking what it is to be king and what to be a man, what to be a human, right? And so we divert ourselves, we play games, sometimes big games, right? Or sometimes little games. And we do that because otherwise we'll realize how miserable we really are. I mean, all you have to do is be alone in a room, and you just immediately know something's wrong, and you immediately go out of the room, turn on the TV set, open your app, post something on Facebook, <laughs> read the paper. I mean, it's, it's really amazing to me how prescient this was, because I see people, you know, people are driving their cars, right? So you're driving this huge piece of machinery they didn't have back in his day. You're driving this huge piece of machinery down the highway at 70 miles an hour, and that's so boring, you have to start looking at your phone. Right? That's how diverted we are. I mean, I've seen people doing that. They're driving down the highway watching a movie on the panel in the dashboard. Why they put these things in the middle of the dashboard is beyond me. But I mean, really, it's amazing. So, so, that's, so anything to keep us from thinking. Or think about movies when you know, Al Pacino's a detective, and he has a marriage that's gone bust and his wife moves out, where's the first place he's gonna go? He goes to a bar. He goes to a bar, why? So he can't think. He drinks until he can't think anymore. This is the moment in your life when you should really think. Right, that's why you've been given reason. Think about what just happened. Why did your wife leave you? What did you do to contribute to this? Where are you gonna go? No, you drink until you pass out. It's a cliche, but it's true, is it thinking right? Or Oh, no, it's not thinking. No, no, what Pascal is saying, no, it's diversion, right? It's to stop thinking, right? So, but, but his point is, it's not reasonable to act that way. It's reasonable to say, if my, the worst thing that ever happened in my life is my wife left me, I need to think about this. I need to think about who I am. Uh, he, he says another, at another point, uh, this man has just lost his son in an accident, but he's not at all worried because he's about to hit a tennis ball back to his friend, right? So, so that's what, you know, so for him, gaming and diversions um, are the way we avoid thinking about ourselves. And he knows that these free thinkers gamble. He hangs out with them, he invented probability to help them out, and so he knows that they're out there every night in the nightlife of Paris gambling so they won't think about themselves. And then they say, Christianity has nothing to say to me. Yeah, Lorraine. Mm -hmm. Because he's got, you know, God is or God isn't. That's a big question. Right. And, and he deals with it in the probability or right. game theory where, you know, when you talk about God, that's eternal. That's infinity. And I remember my son, he's uh, now, I think he's in the year, uh, hopefully I forget, would say, well, then you're dealing with things that approach eternity. But when you're dealing with our life, which is very finite, that's like approaching a zero. Right. So then he's talking about, well, if you make the wrong choice, Mm -hmm. We don't know what God is, but if God is there and we're not understanding that, we could be in for so many problems. Right, right. No, and he would say, it, you know, it, on uh, FanDuel, this would be a no-brainer, right? You've got an eternal benefit from a temporal sacrifice. I mean, the, the, the scale between, the, there's no comparison between the two. And yet we won't wait, and there's no proof. He's not proving it. He's just saying a wager. It's probability, right? What do you have to lose? You're going to lose it anyway. But if you lose it for the sake of God, you gain eternity. If you don't, then you gain nothing, right? Or, or wrath, one of the two. And so for him, uh, actually the point of the whole wager is you won't do it because you love yourself and the world inordinately. And so don't pretend 
you don't have reasons to make this decision. You have every reason to make this decision, but your passions are the problem. So work on your passions, he says. Uh, so it's a really, but thank you for that. Yeah, the wager would be very much coming out of his mathematics of probability. And it would also be, if they were thinking people, they would realize that this is in fact the case. They would want it to be true, that there is a God who will be their infinite happiness. And they don't, so that tells you something about, about them as well. Um, yes? Yeah, no, it's a good question. No, I don't think so. No, it was, uh, there were, it was either um, the Epicurean vision that we're all made up of atoms that are just going to dissolve and then recombine re in uh, different ways. So there's really, it's kind of a nihilism or um, a theism. And so, and those are the two main philosophical trajectories he'll address next, which is uh, theism and atheism, deism and atheism. Um, but those would be, reincarnation wasn't known at his time. Yeah, that's coming down the line. So, so he, he says on that uh, fourth, uh, fourth quote from the bottom, he says, the only thing which consoles us for our miseries is diversion, and yet this is the greatest of our miseries. For it is this which principally hinders us from reflecting upon ourselves, and that's why we should think, and which makes us insensibly ruin ourselves. He says at one point, we hold something in front of us to keep us from noticing we're falling into the grave. Right? So it's, uh, that's his thought. Without this, we should be in a state of weariness, or another way of trans translating that is boredom. And this weariness would spur us to seek a more solid means of escaping from it, from this misery. But diversion amuses us and leads us unconsciously to death. So we'll just keep like people watching a movie in the car and this smashing right into a bridge above them, right? right? And so that would be the metaphor, right? Very young life, a very unwakening Right, life. right, right. But, but, but intentionally diverting ourselves because the minute we stop diverting ourselves, we become bored mm -hmm. or weary, and then we become aware of our misery, I was gonna say right? Yeah. Of our deep unhappiness, okay. right? And we can't see, he, he says at one point, Mankind's problem is that it doesn't know how to remain, remain alone in a room, right? And so, so as long as you can't remain alone in a room, you won't think about your own situation and then what to do about it. But then the problem comes, okay, let's say you do take his point and you're aware of your misery <coughs> and you start using your reason to think about how to get out of that misery. Well, you have the philosophers, right? You're still following reason. You have the philosophers of his day. And the two main philosophical lines in France at this time are Michel de Montaigne on the one hand, who wrote the essays in 1588, a very influential figure, and René Descartes. Yeah. And one of them tells us, Montaigne tells us, what do I know? Right? Reason really can't know much of anything. And we think we're all that and we're not all that. My favorite one is, when your cat's playing with you, who's playing with whom? Right. <laughs> and then he says, he points out, you know, human beings think they're far superior to animals. He says a sparrow within a months of its birth can build a nest and hatch offspring. How long does it take a human being to get out of the house? Right? And so we think we're really something. So Montaigne on the one hand, what, Cusasia, what do I know? And you can doubt everything, and so you have to go with what the church teaches. That was Montaigne's position. And then Descartes says, I can doubt everything except that I doubt. And that leads me to think the first certain idea I have, and that is I'm a doubting thing. And I couldn't doubt without the idea of perfection, which is God. And then God is, this God is a good God, a perfect God, and has implanted the laws of mathematics in my mind. And so I can trust the laws of mathematics to demonstrate the truth. And I can get out of this whole thing now, right? A reason can lead me out of all error if I just follow it. And so Pascal's saying, which one's right? Montaigne is still going to sit there and go, oh, yeah, right. And Descartes's still going to sit there and say, well, yeah, right. right? So, so Pascal's contemporaries, if they stopped in the room and thought and sought guidance from those who claimed to be reasonable, they would run headlong into a contradiction between what he calls greatness and wretchedness. Right? So, so Descartes would lead us to think we're great. Our reason can free us, it, our reason can lead us to the certain knowledge of God. 
Our reason can lead us to certain knowledge of nature. It can free us from illness. Medicine was like one of the main things they wanted to work on. And we can be freed of passion. We can be freed of sin and error, according to Descartes, if you just follow the clear and distinct ideas of reason. And Montaigne is like, nice try. We're just like squirrels. We just act on instinct. Only we're more miserable than squirrels are. Squirrels love hopping around eating acorns. We hate running around eating acorns. So anyway, um, so, so you have this draw, right? They're playing to a draw. That Which one's right? Well, they're both right. How can they both be right? And they keep trying to knock each other out of the ring. This is still going on. We want people who have certainty on the one hand by reason and other people to say, nice try. There's nothing certain according to reason. And so for, for uh, that's where he says, the, um, oh yeah, this is good. So, so the, the, the experience of misery is also an, a revelation of greatness. Right? This is his insight, is that once you're alone in your room and you start thinking about yourself and how miserable you are, you suddenly realize a squirrel's not miserable, but I am. Right? So there must be a principle of greatness in me that makes me miserable. I wish I could be like a squirrel. I love squirrels, by the way, as you can tell. Um, they're crazy right now, but I love them. Uh, so, so there must be a principle of greatness or we wouldn't be miserable just for living lives like squirrels and other animals live. So he says in that third to the last paragraph, the greatness of man, the greatness of humanity, is, or the greatness of man is great in that he knows himself to be miserable. So the fact that you know yourself to be miserable reveals your greatness. A tree does not know itself to be miserable. It is then being miserable to know oneself to be miserable, but it is also being great to know that one is miserable. See, so here we are. This is our contradiction. We are a contradiction of greatness and wretchedness. And our consciousness of our wretchedness reveals our greatness. And the consciousness of our greatness reveals our wretchedness. All of these same miseries prove man's greatness. They are the miseries of a great lord, of a deposed king. So, so we've lost something that we can't find anymore. And that we, the something that we lost makes us great. We're capable of this greatness. But that we've lost it makes us miserable. And we can't lose the capacity for greatness. And we can't lose the fact that we lost it. And so that makes us a living contradiction. We are a contradiction of greatness and wretchedness. And so he says, the philosophers did not prescribe feelings suitable to the two states. They inspired feelings of pure greatness, that would be Descartes in his day, and that is not man's state. They inspired feelings of pure littleness, Montaigne, and that is not man's state. So what is his state, right? So he says, then he talks about how he's going to treat the audience. He says, if he exalts himself, I humble him. If he humbles himself, I exalt him. And I always contradict him until he understands that he is an incomprehensible monster. Right? So that's, that's according to Pascal what we are. We are monsters that, that pass all comprehension. So, so, so for him, the fact that we're a living contradiction and the philosophy of his day proves this, and our experience of our own misery proves this, begs two questions. One is, how did we come to be a contradiction? And B is, how is that contradiction ever to be reconciled? Because if it's not reconciled, we're just going to be perpetually miserable. Right? And we can't use our greatness to escape our misery. The more we accentuate our greatness, the more miserable we become. The more we accentuate our misery, the more our greatness is revealed, because we wouldn't be miserable if we weren't also great. So, so for him, then, this, this is the avenue by which to understand Adam and Christ. Right? You don't start with God created us the beginning good, and we fell into sin, and then he sent Jesus, and everything's better, and we only try, and all that. It's like you start with who we are right now, who you know you are right now. You start with your experience. You stop diverting yourself. That's a key one. Put the cell phone away. Right? Put the stereo away. You see people running in nature with earbuds in. I'm like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> I mean, you know, or looking at their text while they're walking around, uh, walking in the woods, looking at text messages. So anyway, stop diverting yourself, which is hard. I love diversion. Sunday night football is one of my favorites, so that's coming up. Stop diverting yourself, sit in your room and think, and then think about how that came to be and how it could possibly be reconciled. 
So that's his starting point. Don't start with doctrine and narrative and things like that. Start with that. And so he would say, the only thing that explains this contradiction is Adam. That we must, we know, we must have had something at one point of infinite value and we lost it. And no matter, and so he uses this collectively, we each know this, that we had something that we have now lost. And no matter where we look for it, we can't find it, right? Including God. He loves this line from the prophet Isaiah, you are a God who hides yourself. And so God is hiding from us because God knows if we find God in our current condition, we'll become proud. Right? We won't realize what miserable people we are. We'll become proud and use God as an occasion for pride. Uh, on the other hand, God doesn't completely hide so that those who genuinely seek God can find God. Those who humble themselves and are aware of their own misery and unworthiness will actually find God. And so he says, the world reveals neither the absence of God nor the presence of God, but the presence of a hidden God. I think that's an incredible and he says, everything bears this character. So the world, God is hiding in the world, right? Because God won't allow God's self to be known without our simultaneously knowing our own wretchedness, right? And it's, we, it's because we lost God due to our own fault and that God is hiding from us. And so we have this infinite abyss. Our misery is we have an infinite abyss in our lives that can only be filled by an infinite object. And our souls need to be filled by this infinite object. And they're not. What we, all we find are finite objects that don't fill us, right? And so, um, so for him, the goal then becomes, how do you find, I'm sorry, Gay, did you have a question? No, it's okay, no question. Just uh, something that's reminded me of that sort of short essay, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Yeah, that would be a very Pascalian <laughs> thought. How difficult can we age show, show this? Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. You know, what is man that thou art mindful right. of the son of man that may be a little lower than you? Yeah. Amusing ourselves to death, we're yep. going there. Yep. Preferring that which keepeth our ears to what is the truth. It's just fascinating. Yeah, but he, and he does, that's it, you're absolutely right, and that would be his point. Descend on Pascal because his mind is fantastic. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. And so, but the, key, the genius of it, I think, is that he's giving scriptural truth and church truth without it being scriptural or church truth, without it being authoritative. So he's saying, anyone can say, believe what I tell you or else. He says, you know, any religion like that, don't believe it for a minute. But if a religion tells you, this is who you are, you know this is who you are, and this is how to solve who you are, listen to it. Not because you have to, but because, you go, oh my God, they understand, they understand me, right? So. You have to start where people are. Right, right. Wrong, you begin. You don't start with, oh, this is us, we're not now. Right. Where are you, right? And where are you going? And how did you get here, right? What, is it, what do you actually believe? Right, or what is it you actually want? Yeah. And why are you so miserable, right? <laughs> so, no, it's really good. Yeah, so, so he says right in the, uh, let me just get to these two things. Um, so we lost God, he says, uh, right in the uh, middle, he says, the knowledge of God without that of man's misery causes pride. The knowledge of man's misery without that of God causes despair. The knowledge of Jesus Christ constitutes the middle course because in him we find both God and our misery. And then I love this line. Jesus Christ is a God whom we can approach without pride and before whom we humble ourselves without despair. So only by encountering God in Christ can you then know God without pride and know yourself without despair. So for him, the contradiction is resolved by Christ, right? who is God united to a miserable human being, right? A wretched human being. And so God, so if you know Christ, you know your wretchedness, because you can't know him. He's not some triumphant figure, right? And if you know Christ, you also know God. And you know your own misery, and you know your own greatness without despair or without pride. It's actually, a, it's an amazing, it's an amazing move. And so for him, you know, he says at one point, that we have an infinite abyss that must be filled with an infinite object, uh, he says in the third of the bottom quote, and then I'll have to wrap it up, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Christians is a God of love and comfort, 
a God who fills the soul of heart and heart of those whom he possesses, a God who makes them conscious of their inward wretchedness and his infinite mercy, who unites himself to their inmost soul, who fills the soul with humility and joy, with confidence and love, who renders them incapable of any end other than himself. So that would be, that's the goal toward which Pascal is trying to direct the reader, if you will. But I mean, it's, an, it's absolutely <laughs> a fascinating, a fascinating route. Um, and then he says later uh, in that second to last paragraph, by his grace, by Christ's grace, I await death in peace in the hope of being eternally, eternally united to him, yet I live with joy. Right, joy so that, peace. joy and peace, no, exactly, exactly. So th that shows the switch, is that you can actually look death in the eye and not be afraid of it, right? And so you can look death in the eye and be at peace, and you can look death at the eye and experience joy. And so it would be something you can verify, right? If you look to Christ and you don't experience peace and joy, well, then there's something wrong. But he would say, can't do that. Not possible, <laughs> right? So anyway, anyway, I hope, I hope you found this intriguing. If you, if you have the chance to read the whole pensée, it's definitely worth doing. They're really quite remarkable. So, All right, thank you, friends. Thank you.